So, we will be building on the Python we have already learnt. Probably it is a good time to take a few minutes. If anyone has any doubt on the Python you have tried out any anything, this would be a great time to get a quick refresher going, so that we can get on with the topic of the day. Okay. We are going to go through a lot of stuff, but like I said, we are going to go through it interactively. So, you should whatever is there after the dollar, please remember that says type. At the dollar prompt, type ipython minus pylab, you should see some announcements and followed by an in square bracket 1. So, at the prompt, do ipython minus pylab. it will make a lot of noise and then finally, give you a a prompt i n followed by a number within square brackets. Very strongly advise you not to write down. As a trainer, my opinion, my experience, you are welcome to ignore me of course, it is a free country, at least it used to be. So, you are welcome to write down. But, if you want to learn, I would extremely strongly suggest that you forget the existence of things called pens and paper, use your brain and the computer, the computer is optional. All right. This way you try, you talk to me, when you write, I do not know of any paper that is as interactive that talks back to you. Since we do not have that yet maybe we will arrange for it in the 2025 workshop. Till then, I suggest you close down whatever notebooks you have brought, manage to lose the pens, type and talk. You are lot more likely, if you have a problem, talk about it, you will retain lot more than by writing down, because whatever is written down, there is only one use for it, namely forgetting where it is after half an hour. You are not going to index it, there is no way to refer back and find out something in the written notes. Standard operating procedure for any written notes is it is written, never read. So, we will not do that. All right. So, what is that we are supposed to do? Type these two commands at the prompt, i n prompt p equal to lin space minus p i comma p i comma 100 and then plot p comma cos p. If you are following me, p equal to will be i n 1 and plot would be i n 2. Now, what is p? How do you find out? Simply type p at the prompt and hit enter, see what happens. What do you get? Error. Arrays. Arrays. Sorry, we are all divided by the same language. The way I mispronounce English is different from the way you mispronounce English. So, so P is an array of 100 points. So, you could check what is the first point by P of 0, P of minus 1 will give you the last point and len of P will tell you how many points are there. Unsurprisingly, it will tell you 100. All right. So, it does not take a rocket scientist to figure out plot plots two arrays. There are two arrays coming from p is an array and cos p is also an array. p is an array of 100 elements, cos p an array of the first element is the cos of the first element in p and so on. So, it is essentially plotting two arrays, but it by default the default properties it plots a continuous line rather than a scatter diagram types. Of course, all of this is changeable, the color it plots with, the thickness of the line, everything is changeable, we will see that. Now, we are using ipython, which is an IDE of sorts for python. So, ipython provides some additional 
help to learn python the most important is that question mark so you type lin space question mark at the prompt i python will tell you what is lin space so presume we already know how to plot we understand that we are plotting two arrays and we are plotting using the default plotting characteristics which as of now is simply a continuous line and in blue of a certain thickness and we also see that i python has one convenient characteristic namely it will tell you something about a function if you do lin space or whatever question mark all right can we go on now we would like to change the color change the thickness and so on do a clf and guess what clf does it clears the plot area do a plot p comma sin p with r in single quotes you should get yeah the sin curve but the plot characteristics we are changing now instead of the default characteristics we are getting the color characteristic is changed to red by that r we have one more line width again no prices for guessing what characteristic that changes it will produce a thicker line and you can give a dot instead of a continuous line it will plot points if you make any mistake the best thing you can do is stand up and talk about it because some other people have are not intelligent enough to have made the same mistake so they will lose the opportunity to learn from that so you made a mistake stand up say what happened that would be the most convenient thing you can do for all of us to learn the point is or and the dot does not give red colored dots prefix the dot with an or put it in a single quote rather than give two strings that's one of the nicest things about working interactively you can make a few mistakes i python will grumble sometimes even call you names but you ignore it it's a bloody program after all and then you can go ahead and learn much better than writing believe me when you try it out you will get lot more lot faster and for the record i don't use that much of python for scientific computing so some of the like say prabhu or madhu so some of the minor th some of these things i haven't done so i would say i'll give you a very similar answer try it out and r dot also works oh, that's what he said that's what he said which brings me to another point when somebody says something please drop what you are doing and listen if you are going to make every mistake yourself and learn we will be here till 2015 it's a wonderful idea to learn from others mistakes that's a more intelligent way in my opinion so when someone talks drop what you are doing and listen to what the person is saying this will reduce the amount of things you have to do on your own anyway dot or r dot the issue is that if you give two separate strings it won't work give a single string it works as expected additive that is all and as usual plot question mark will tell you lot more about plot than you ever want to know i am not joking just look at it it will give you so many things 3 4 pages or if, if not more so that was one type of doing some extra fittings to a curve 
or a plot, let us do some more like adding a title. Unsurprisingly, the command is title. When you say title, it adds to If you know LaTeX, you know LaTeX produces lovely output for mathematical expressions in particular, you can add LaTeX expressions to title. The presence of a dollar tells you that, tells title that you are using a mathematical expression, that is all. All right, can I move on? can add labels to the axis, x labels adds the axis for the, the label for the x axis and y label. Once again you can use LaTeX expressions, essentially in embedded mathematical expressions using a dollar for where any title labels are expected. You can also annotate meaning draw attention by marking a particular part of a curve or the plot by giving some annotation text. For example, in this parabola we have said this is the local maximum and the x y equal to command says where to position that text and that x y numbers are in data coordinates, not in any pixel size or anything. The actual values you are plotting 2 and minus 1 are in the context of those values. All right. Let me repeat the last point. These x y values are what you are this 2 and 1 is the x y values in the data set it has nothing to do with 2 inches or anything in the graphic output space. I would like to call it as the data space. Whatever data you are plotting, the 2 value in the x and minus 1 value in the y, wherever that is the corresponding position. Because you can scale, you can do different things to the chart, but the values will remain. All right, can we move on? Now, if you look at it, So, if you look at this, there are some, we can improve this by adding a x label, y label, we saw that, let us add that. So, you can see all of that appearing on the screen, but there is one area in which the graph is still visually unappealing. There is a small bit of real estate here, there is a larger bit of real estate here and this is touching the axis. So, if you are going to do a present this graph, you would rather like that part to be much better, correct? I am choosing the problem in the chart as I have presented. In a different chart, you may want to chart only a certain area, you may want to highlight. So, you may want more control over which parts you are charting, correct. So, for that purpose, we have two commands, they are the x limb and y limb. Now, if I say x limb without any arguments, it gives me the answer. 
the value it is using is it is plotting x from 0 to 7. Please remember we never said anything like that. We simply said p equal to minus 0 to 2 pi. It decided to go from 0 to 7. Okay. Similarly, volume tells us minus 1 to 1. Now, these functions tell us the current limits or the current axis limits of the chart. We can change by the same function, we can say the x limb If you give it two values, it will use those as the new limits. Oh, sorry. This is what I did. I set up a new x limb. Now, let us look at the chart. You see, there is a uniformity, the extra space here has been chopped off. Right? Then, but this part is still touching, so we will change that by doing volume So, this is the first command we did for setting up x limb, then we will do volume also. I know it is minus 1 to 1, so I am doing this. So, you can see there is a bit of a space all around now. Understood? So, x limb and y limb are an interesting type of functions. When invoked without arguments, they tell you what the values are. When invoked with arguments, they set the values. If you are used to programming in say something like Java, you have the idea of a getter and a setter in an object oriented context. Getters get you the value of variables, setters set the value of those variables. X limb, Y limbs are both getters and setters. Without argument, they will get you the current values. If you supply arguments, they will make them the new values. Understood? This sort of concession of notation is something that permeates Python, because rather than you have to invent two new names and all that nonsense, x limb is x limb. Without arguments, obviously, natural meaning is I want to know what the limits are. When you give arguments, the natural meaning is I want to set these limits for x. So, there are not two separate functions for that purpose. Can we move on? Now, this is all nice and dandy to do all this stuff. But some of you would have discovered you would have made a typing error. So, you have to start from the beginning. So, what happens if every time you have to type that is not going to work. Our aim in life is not to create such beautiful pictures and look at them. We obviously want these or similar charts to be produced to be part of a document. Okay. So, the way we normally work is interactively try different things, figure it out. Once you have done it, we do not want to reinvent the wheel. We want to be able to say next time I want to plot this, I do not want to go through all this typing, I do not want to go through this mistakes correction, simply it should come in one shot. That is what we call a script. We can capture whatever we did into a script and run the script. There are two ways of doing it. One is you can open a text editor, remember what all you typed, type it p equal to lin space plot v x label, y label, title, x limb, y limb, save it, run it, everything will happen. But that is not interesting. Why should you retype? Why should you repeat work you have done? Interactively you have worked so far, there must be a way to use the work you have already done and there is. IPython provides you the command called percentage hist. So, whatever you typed, 
including all the mistakes you made, the commas you forgot, the times you decided lint space is better spelt without a A, all of that is available. Remember not to exit next time. I do not know, uh, does history persist across sessions? Try it out. I think it is settable. I think it is settable in IPython whether history persists or not. If you have done the shell scripting, you know there also shell history is persists. I do not know whether IPython history persists. I remember it persists. Does not persist? I think it is settable. I will I'll look it up and tell you. But typically the way we want to work is we interactively because you do not want to remember these commands, believe me. That is not the way, that is not required, which is why I am a little harsh about please do not write down stuff. If you have to remember these things, the game is lost. So, interactively you sit down, do type half the command, hit tab, hit question mark, figure out, try it out, then at hist gives you what is available. So, if you run at hist, you will see that the commands you have produced are there, you have typed so far are there. Now, the next step is to save that command into a script rather than type again, correct? And that is possible, that is percentage save. Percentage save plot underscore script. Uh, get the output for the hist uh, percentage hist, uh, then percentage hist 5 also I get, but the last option that uh, percentage hist 5, the previous one, I did not get it. I what error did you get? Invalid uh, literal for int. Did you type 10 or 1 more? Yes, hi hyphen 10 is a spelling mistake. Srikant, please make a note to be fixed in the archives. So, the 5 hyphen 10 is not required, 5 10, space 10. All right, thank you for the spotting that. Now, you can save the commands you have typed into a file percentage save is the command for it. Then you give the name of the script in you want to save, Srikant move, you are blocking somebody behind you. Percentage save plot underscore script dot py says save into this file 1 space 3 hyphen 6 space 8 says save line 1, lines 3, 4, 5, 6 and 8 they are not particularly magic numbers, you have chosen some example to tell you. So, in real life what you will do, you will look at and then say ok. I want this you will say I want to look at these commands produce whatever I wanted to produce, right. Uh, but what if I want to reproduce this chart, right with the title, with the x label, everything, what all do I need? I lean 2, correct? I need 3, 4, 5, 6, then 16 and 17, correct? So, I will save that. How would I save that? Let us remember the numbers, because my screen is not big enough to keep both. So, it is 2 to 6 and 16 and 17.
So, it also tells you the following commands are written to this script. So, this represents a very canonical way of doing things. You interactively try out different stuff. Once you have figured out, once you have got it the way you want, save it into a script, then you run the script, you will repeat whatever you wanted to do. Or you may want to modify it for different parameters, different things. It is lot simpler to edit a file than to retype everything. Understood? So, how do we run that? How do you know it is there? It was not there already. We do not. So, let us do it again. Try it, save it, run it, see, remember to do a CLF. Does it produce a chart? Does it? No, it would not, because there is a significant one important dif difference between running a script and typing interactively. Whatever you type interactively will get shown in the plot area without you doing anything, but when you run a script that is not going to happen. Why? The script may not even run with a screen. Correct? This may be part of a large program you write, which is running off some server, which does not even have a monitor. Okay. It may be generating this data of a cluster of computers, which is somewhere else. So, when you run the script, the assumption is not that there is a monitor available. The assumption is, yes, the curve is generated. You want to see it, you tell me. How do I tell? How do we tell it? That is all. Because chances are you will rarely want to look at the output of a script. You are more likely to want to save it to a graphics file, PNG file, JPEG file, or whatever, rather than look at it. Looking at things is something you are more likely to do interactively. For that and the other reason, namely, when you run a script, the script is capable of being run off a machine without even a monitor there is no default display attempted by any python program. You have to do this show to show it. You need not do a show. You may directly save it as a png jpeg file. We will see it in a minute how to do that, so which is what the slide ex explains. When you run a script, you are not in interactive mode. So, the default activities of the interactive mode namely update the plotting area of after every command, those things do not work. You have to explicitly say show and chances are like I said, you may not even want to do that, because you may want to simply save the output. This is the way. So, you will take that add save fig to the last command, then your script runs, produces a chart or a plot saves it to a PNG file in this case and exits current directory. Ask away, ask for the mic and ask away. If we write the Python code, if you want to plot some figures, we need to end the Python code in show function, it will plot. Yes you can add show as a last command in your script. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That is the idea. Since we had not discussed show till then, we are doing it interactively, but show is available for the script also. But like I was saying, chances are low that you will run a script to see a chart interactively. But yes, show can be made the last command in a script. So, at the end it will show but you will, you are more likely to have a script without having show or save. Run it, do a show interactively to check, save interactively. If 
because you may want to say with a different name and so on. That is more usual use case. So, say if it takes one argument based on the extension given, it figures out how to save it. The extensions supported are many. It supports EPS. Those of you who are used to generating LaTeX documents will know EPS is embedded postscript and generally it plays well with their LaTeX documents. You can generate EPS graphs also. All right. Let me summarize this. The way you work is interactively you try out different things. Once you have figured out what to do, you use the hist command to look at what commands work because you would have made some errors, you would have made try 2, 3 values and so on. You use the hist command, pick out, cherry pick the correct lines, put them into a file using the save file command and then you are ready to repeat that set of actions every time you want. Understood? Any questions? It supports like I said a large number of formats, PNG, PDF, PS, EPS, SVG. EPS is likely to be one of most interest to you, particularly if you are writing documents in uh, LaTeX. Sir, already we have created a file called python script.py. There we are having some four lines. As Sir said, if I want, if I want to include show, if I again create, a, I have to create a new file or if I use the same file, it will be overwritten. How to append that line in that file? Open it in an editor. It's how do you append, how do you add to any file? It is a normal file in your operating system, nothing special. You created it through the save command. Other than that, it is nothing special. It is like any normal text file or any normal python file. If you are trying to say from IPython, obviously it is going to override. It is it's now a regular text file. You want to add something, probably the preferred method is to open it in editor and edit rather than retype the whole thing in or run another save fig command. Sorry, run another save file command. You can do that. You can type a show and then look up the previous command and do it, but yes. It may be simpler to edit, but let me repeat the idea is to work interactively, cherry pick the commands, save it into a script and then name it nicely so that it is reusable for you. Understood? Now, one thing we have been doing is we have been issuing different commands. All these commands are additive, if you notice. When we typed X label, whatever was on the screen remained. The curve was there. Y label remained. Title, everything was there. In the same way, if you two put two plots, you will see that both appear on the plotting area. Try it out. But once again, this is not anything special. You should expect it by now because this is what you have been relying on. Every command simply adds to the existing content on the draw area. X label, Y label, title, annotate. So, plot is yet another command. So, that also is additive. All right. Sometimes that is what we want. Often in experiments, we may want two different related experiment data to be on the same multiple colors. And as you will note, IPython rather matplotlib, which is working behind the screen for us, takes care of changing the color for the two plots, right. If you do two plots, both appear on two different colors. You did not say anything for it. This is one of the things we often talk about in Python, the defaults work. By and large, type in English what you want, 95 percent of the time that is the command. You want a title, type title. You want X label, type X label. Just think what you want to do, type a command, chances are very high, you have got 90 percent of it right and it will work as expected. There is, you do not have to worry about colors if you are adding two plots. Okay. This is often nice behavior because this is what we want. We want two plots in the same area and so on, but sometimes this is not what we want. 
what do we do? CLF clears, I want two charts. I want the same data, I do not want to type everything, right? I may have this x equal to lin space, so much of work done, I may want to plot slightly two different things. Those sort of situations you have, oh sorry, before that, when you plot multiple things, the legend is a useful idea. Normally, when you are plotting only one, you do not need a legend. But when you plot multiple curves in the same one chart, you would warmly want to annotate saying the green one is the sine curve, the blue one is the cos curve, etcetera, right. Or in this case, one is with 10 points, the other with 500 points. So, if you do this legend by default, See, there are actually two here. Now, a legend Notice that IPython, Python, Matplotlib, whatever you want to think of it as, takes care of keeping track of which color goes with what legend, nothing. You do not have to remember any of that. You plotted two, so your job is to ensure that you give it to the legends in the right order. The first string must be for the first plot, the second string must be for the second plot, that is your job. Connecting with the correct color, it will take care, all right. Also, the positioning of where the legend is, is what Matplotlib thinks is a reasonably good idea. Normally, it tries to hit a unpopulated region, but sometimes it may or may not coincide with your idea of where the legend should be. So, you have the option of changing its location. got the quotes. Notice that unlike other plotting elements, legend is replacing, it is not additive. You do not see two legends. Again common sense. You will have two labels, but you will rarely have two legends for a chart. 
So, if you give two legend commands, chances are you are trying to correct rather than type two legends. So, Python takes the common sense decision and says throw the old one, put the new one, if you give two legend commands. There are other options for location, again right, left, try out different things, best fit and so on, it will decide where it goes. You can also use the figure command to do the other thing we are talking about. I want to see two, three charts, decide which one to pick. If I keep overdoing, overlaying, I am not going to get the best idea. So, there is a command called the figure command, which essentially says whatever follows applies to figure number 1. If you give a figure 1 command, it essentially says from now on whatever I type, update drawing area 1. Figure 2, from now on whatever I type, update drawing area 2 and so on. So, you can switch from one to the other, give commands. Essentially, it is setting the current workspace if you want to think of it that way. So, the figure command sets the current workspace. So, figure 1 says here, figure 2 says there, whatever command follows, figure command by itself does not do any output. It merely decides where the output of the next command is going to go. Sir, in the previous one, the legend uh, just fixes it into the center, center right or left, but I want to fix it on the right most corner, how to fix that? Location is it possible? I use the XY, it is not working. How do we answer such questions? How do I mean? I am not here. When you go there, how do you answer such a question? How do you find out the answer to such a question? we get back to the figure command. The figure command essentially decides where the output of the next plotting command is going to go, that is all. So, you can have multiple figure commands given, you can have 4 or 5, any number open at the same time. Typically, you will find 2, 3 suffices for all your practical needs. The most common use case is you are trying out 2 different plotting possibilities or colors, you want to decide which one looks good. So, you do not want to type the commands for lint space and all the other functions again and again, you just the plot commands you want to look at in two different things. If you overlay obviously, it is the same plot, it will merge one over the other, you will not see anything. So, you say a figure plot, figure 2 plot, look at the two, decide which one fits your purposes better. Agreed? You can also run save fig commands again, that will also be associated with the figure. The close command closes the currently active figure and sh shifts to the next one. If you have 3 active and you are in 2, you close, what happens? You figure it out. So, you can do subplots. Typically, you may see 4, 5 plots inside one log, log, one log, log semi log, all that stuff. Subplots are the way to go. So, essentially you are specifying how many you want, subplot 2 1 says I want 2, 2 rows in one column. So, 2 1 1 says I am referring to the first one, 2 1 2 says I am referring to the second one. Try it out and see how it plays out. Once again, these are based on what you need to produce. Sometimes a subplot is a better way to produce two, sometimes you want two independent ones. You choose based on what 
is more appropriate for your purpose. All right. So, between default overlaying the figure command and subplot, you can get any permutation combination of whatever suits your purpose. All right. Can we move on? But we rarely want to print these nice looking analytical functions. Who wants to print sin x and cos x? We all know how it looks like, they are rather boring. You are more interested in plotting data you have, right? And that data obviously, you are not going to type, okay? So, chances are that data comes from some other program or a system and is available in some format. It is probably available as a particular data file. If the data file obeys certain rules or can be that data file can be massaged to certain appropriate formats, then you can directly ingest the data into a Python script. You can read the data in one shot through something called load text. You should have a file called primes.txt in your yeah. So let's first download the first download this file primes.txt from Moodle. Go to Moodle. There is a resource called files somewhere. From there, you should be able to. download this file primes.txt, open it in a text editor, do not edit, do not change anything, view it in a text editor and convince yourself what it contains is ordinary text data. All right. So, has everyone got the primes.txt file? some answer in a language which does not use silence would be acceptable. Have we all downloaded primes.txt? Who has not? When people say yes, if you keep quiet, you expect me to have ESP to figure it out. So, if you print it, you will see something like this. right? So, it contains data one column at a time nicely. Have you all got it? Can we move? If you have this file, now we want to ingest this data inside. So, we simply issue a command load txt and that gets us Sir, excuse me. Sir, there the text file is written in column wise, primes dot text. They have inserted number column wise. If we insert the number in row wise, in space is given, this print is giving a list. In the primes dot text, the numbers are written in one column, that is yes. one, one after another. One data per line. Uh, per line. If we write it in one line, it is producing a list. The resultant of out uh, print primes is a list. Okay. Load text is not, think about it this way. If the only use for load text is for one column data, will it be useful? Is how frequent is one column data in real life? Actually, load text will load multi column data. When you give it one line, it is looking at that many columnar data, only one of them that is all. Low text always gives you a list, a list of lists to be precise. It is always giving you a list. Okay. We have just, in order to explain low text, we have chosen a slightly unrealistic example of one column data, which does not exist. In real life, you need at least two x and y for any meaningful data. But before that, before complicating the whole thing, we want to show you 
with one column data the basic syntax of load text, that is all. You have to actually give the complete path. If it is in the current directory, you do not have to, since in my machine it is not in the current directory, I am giving the complete path. So, now what type of data is primes? It is a list. In other words, you had how many items? You have 25 data items, so it is ingested it into a 25 item list. Now, in the file, what is the first data? The one in the first line, fourth data, one in the fourth line. In the list, what is the first data? What is the fourth data? That correspondence still remains, correct? When you print primes, the way to display an array is like this, array inherently is not horizontal or vertical, right. So, the data is still in the same format with one important distinction. The file data was all integers, this is all float. By definition, load text and entire python data processing assumes you are dealing with float data, which is most likely the case, I mean, unless you are doing heavy computational number theory, you are unlikely to be dealing with num integers. So, you can understand how time saving this is, simply ingest some data. Obviously, very rarely you will have 25, Professor Prabhu Ramachandran typically talks in terms of gigabytes of data, which he produces after running programs for a couple of months and then runs another set of programs on those gigabytes for a couple of more months, producing even more gigabytes of data boggles the mind. Anyway, so such data is very easy to load into a variable into your program very simply. We chose the simplest example. Supposing it was two column layout, what would happen? Let us try it out. Let us try, let us try it out. The simplest way to do anything is to try it out. So, let us create another file. So, I created a file with three data, we do not, we do not need 300 pieces of data to test something. get a two dimensional array. The first line is here, the second line is here, third line is here and so on, which is this is more useful. You are more likely to have multi column data than anything else and 
even thousands of lines of data, particularly if it comes from another source, all you need to do is save it into a file and pull it in. Sir, okay. one question. Sir, if we do uh, type t and we are getting num py dot nd array. What's the question? Question is like what is that type like? So I know it is in coming in array. Yeah, it is an array. But I do not understand the prefix that num py. Num py is the numeric py package which is required. Even the word array has a very special meaning. We will take a minute to understand that. Have you done lists already for them? Shrikan, lists already done. So, why is it called an array and not a list? It is still in the same square bracket, right? Why is it not a list? Why is it an array? So, logic tells you there is a distinction between a list and an array. Arrays are not an auto or not a built in data type in Python. Lists are. But lists are heterogeneous data structures. You know the papers we have distributed are magical. Whatever is there will be there even when you go to the room. So, you can read it then also. Obviously, Mr. Ebenezer does not believe me it is magical. He believes unless he reads it now, it will disappear. That paper is magical paper. Whatever is printed there, will be there in even when you take it to your room, okay? it will not disappear. Normally, I refuse to distribute paper for this reason, because this is one of the few times teachers behave like children. They cannot stop reading something fantastic, goof, it will disappear. I will not learn it. If I do not read it now, let that idiot blather something on the stage, who cares? Remember how you would feel if your students are, when your students do it to you. You also know where they are learning their bad habits from. All right. So, a list is a heterogeneous data structure. It is a built in, but it is not the most convenient for the type of work we are doing now. For scientific computing, we do not want heterogeneous data structure. We are wanting to do high performance numeric computation. So, Python by definition, by default, sorry, does not have anything to handle it. The lists are the only data structure. So, we use external libraries, NumPy, which stands for numerical Python is the first of such libraries, which provides specialized data handling data structures, the first of which is an array. An array is not part of Python, an array is a homogeneous data structure. It is assumed to all contain floats, plus an array is normally immutable. So, by making these additional assumptions about what is in an array, what operations are expected of it, Python can generate much more efficient code. So, inverting a 100 by 100 matrix will actually happen in seconds instead of days if you use list, because the list supports a variety of operations. Lists are expandable, list can contain lists, which can contain lists, each list can contain different number of elements. So, all of this flexibility comes at a performance computation cost, none of which is necessary when we are dealing with experimental numerical data. So, NumPy gives you that data structure called an array. So, when you use load text, you are creating a NumPy array and not a list. Agreed? So, this is many things that happen under the table. Some of the things you have to make it happen yourself, which we will talk about a little later in the program, but this is probably a good time to worry about our ingesting food rather than Python ingesting data. All right. Any questions before we break for lunch? 
suppose I want to get the same data type that is stored in the file. Usually file in files will store characters. Since it is a text file, so I want to get back the characters. Instead of float, I want to get back it as a character. Why would you do that in scientific computing? Don't use loot text. Read file the normal way. Have you taught them read file? Yes, sir. Read. Read file the usual way. This is saving you lot of typing. Please remember load text is a shorthand for read a file line by line, parse it into how many or many pieces are, convert the data type of all of them into float, load them from a list into an array. All of that line, some 40, 50 lines of code is compressed into one for load text. So, load text has a use case. If that is not what you need, do not use load text. So, then how to find out a mode of a curve? That is a joke. What is the mode of a curve? Those will be a which part of which packages you expect to contain it. Make a guess. Scientific practice. Statistics. There are statistical packages. Yes. Sir. So, there is in sci fi mean, median, mode is there, I think. We will look it up. We will look it up. There is. The we will go into what are available in NumPy, SciPy a little later. Here we are just dipping the toes in the water. So we will go through a more thorough, uh, not thorough, a little more detailed look into what are the various functionality available in SciPy and NumPy a little later. Sir, yes, if sir. we are having multiple columns and if you want to have 3D plot, is it possible? Three-dimensional plot, 3D plot. Not in Matplotlib, but yes, 3D plots are. In this Professor Python. Prabhu Ramachandran's speciality. Okay. It, it is possible with Python. It is, yeah, possible. it is possible. Very much possible. Matplotlib, the underlying library we are using now is a 2D plotting library. But there are other 3D plotting libraries which you can use. Matplotlib also does some 3D. Huh? Some 3D, but it is I mean it is not in the, uh, I think it is in the what do you call the under development version, not in the regular version not yet released if I remember right. Victory was talking about that. Yeah. To for our purposes, the, the plotting all you saw, whenever you typed plot, you would have seen some long string saying matplotlib x y z. That matplotlib is the library which is being used by python to do the plotting. So, matplotlib is a 2D plotting library. So, you need to invoke a 3D plotting library to get that done. Let us see whether we have some time to show it. If we have, we will we'll maybe demo Mayavi. Mayavi is lot more than a 3D plotting thing. It is a full fledged high muscle power visualization toolkit. I know very little about it. I know Prabhu wrote it and I am very carefully keeping my knowledge to that level. 